And speaking of the health of the financial system, regulators are continuing their efforts to insulate the U.S. banking system from another calamity. The Federal Reserve shocked the banking community earlier this summer when the central bank, along with the FDIC and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, proposed adopting stringent international capital requirements known as Basel III for all U.S. banks. The rules are aimed at stopping major bank failures during times of stress that could lead to taxpayer bailouts by requiring banks to lean more heavily on equity than debt to fund themselves. The proposed rule, which would be phased in from 2013 to 2019, would require banks to maintain a level of common equity equal to 7% of their risk-weighted assets. That compares with current capital standards as low as 2%. Here to weigh in on whether the Fed's capital proposal will safeguard the banking system is Anant Edmati, professor of finance and economics at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. Edmati has helped lead the push for higher capital requirements, warning about the dangers of allowing large banks to operate with high levels of debt. Professor Edmati, welcome. Thank you. You've been quite vocal when it's come to capital requirements for banks. What's your take on the Fed's proposed adoption of Basel III for U.S. banks? Well, I'm glad they're going with the minimum, but I'm very unhappy they're only going with the minimum because Basel III is really a minimum requirement that was uh, obtained in a process that was, oh, let's say, highly political with some countries lobbying because their banking their bankers lobby for lower requirement and there's really no reason for the requirements to be that way except uh you know every banker tell their own regulators don't be harsher on us than the other guy and so they kind of go to the lowest common denominator which is uh which is the minimum so i'm glad we didn't we didn't go mm -hmm. below that uh that, that that we did adopt that because it's a little better than before but i think the whole uh basel three is uh, quite flawed and inefficient insufficient and it's not gonna why is, it flawed? why is it flawed and why is it not enough then in your view? You say it's the minimum. It's both. I mean, it, it, the numbers are low and the whole system of the risk weights that you mentioned mm -hmm. is also flawed. Mm -hmm. You can see that in Europe really very, very clearly how it's really not worked out for Europe because what happened in Europe was that just like if you do invest in something that is labeled AAA by the credit rating agencies, in Europe, they allow the banks to lend to governments, any government in the euro, with no equity. In other words, no ability to absorb losses. So you have a bank like Dexia, which was a French-Belgian bank, that looked fine on the even the Basel ratios. As long as soon as Greece defaulted on some of its debt, Dexia needed a bailout. It needed to be nationalized. So that shows you what's going on. The banks get incentives to um, lend to governments and to do all kinds of other lending, not necessarily even lending for the economy through these risk weights, because they always want to go to something that has some return, but that, that somehow they can leverage more investing in it. They don't need a lot of loss absorbing equity to invest in it. So the risk weight system is very distortive and actually biased against business lending and in favor of all kinds of other things, you know, securities, uh, AAA, whatever they can make to look good uh, and look safe. And all these things that look safe to these regulations, they could actually inflict a lot of losses. With the exception of the possible surcharge that uh, the Fed uh, might uh, apply to uh, the larger banks, do you think mm -hmm. that uh, these capital requirements should apply to the smaller banks and some of these community banks that really weren't involved with uh, the calamity of 2008? Well, I think that it's not as important for them, but I think it is important for all the banks to rely much more on equity than on debt. Mm -hmm. It's true that you know smaller banks might not have as much other non-deposit debt than, uh, than the larger banks. For JP Morgan, for example, it only has half of its debt, a trillion dollars. That is, uh, that is, uh, and that's half, depending on the accounting standard, it's it, 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 it most half mm -hmm. of deposits and the rest is all kinds of other debt. But even for the smallest banks, the bank is healthier if uh, we can have too many small banks to fail and all kinds of things. We had savings and loans. Mm -hmm. uh, if they, for example, retain their earnings for a while, even if they don't have access to equity markets and they can't raise equity, 
they would be healthier if they had a higher equity funding. Uh, even if they got added and they did anything with it, would make them safer and more able to absorb losses. So I think budget requirements are not high for anybody, and mm -hmm. they should be much, much higher for the systemic banks. Uh, the, the rule has been certainly a contentious one uh, for banks and regulators, and a lot of the banks have been fighting these capital requirements, and yeah. they claim that holding too much capital would actually uh, force them to cut back on lending and raise the cost of loans. Uh, certainly, it would hurt their profits, so you can see maybe why they're saying that. But uh, uh, what impact would these uh, rules have on uh, lending? What is most important in transitioning to higher capital requirements is to not have an efficient uh, shrinkage if that's if that's you know shrinking in general could be good for the big banks but the short-term medicine for sure is that they will not pay out to their equity holders so if a dollar is paid to dividend to as dividends to equity holders that's a dollar that could have been lent so they can lend if they just retain their earnings for a while. So any dollar that they already have, they don't need to pay it out and then go borrow again. That makes them less stable. They should do anything but that. They could pay down some of their debts. That would be good if they don't have good loans to make, but otherwise they can lend. There's no problem with lending with equity money. They just don't like it. So if it becomes more expensive for them, the point is that the only reason for that is that they lose, that they take some downside risk away from other people. So whatever they lose in profits, it comes at the expense of the public or the creditors, mm -hmm. FDIC or anybody else. Professor Edmati of Stanford University, thank you so much for coming on the program and sharing your insight.